Welcome, 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 friend. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, and weird history. It is fully December. It is the last month of 2023, and I hope this year has been the year that you needed, and if it hasn't, I hope that next year is. And um, <clears throat> here at For the Love of History, we, uh, we're doing things a little differently. We have no holiday-themed episodes. <laughs> I don't know who decided to do that past TK. It was me. I decided to do that. Uh, but uh, there is no holiday or Christmas-themed episode this year. However, there are plenty of holiday and Christmas-themed episodes from years past. There's a whole playlist on Spotify, so if you're in the hankering for some Krumpus or some Saturnalia history, you can go ahead and head over to that playlist. But today, dear one, today we are doing something a little bit different. But before we get into today's episode, just a little bit of housekeeping. We are growing so much over on YouTube and I'm very thankful for how much we've been growing. So just a quick reminder, if you haven't subscribed over there yet, that would be super duper helpful. Also, if you haven't already, it would be really cool if you left a rating or review or use the new feature on Spotify, which is leaving a comment on an episode, which is uh, amazing. I absolutely love that Spotify does this and it lets me see what your thoughts are on a specific episode. So if you haven't already, it would be really, really cool if you went and wrote a little comment. I read every single one of the comments and reviews myself. So if you write one, I will see it, which sounds like a threat, but I promise it's not. <laughs> The final little piece of housekeeping is a quick announcement of the annual For the Love of History census, which will be coming out next week. Basically, it's a way that I can get some direct input from you on what topics you'd like to see in the next season, what changes you'd like to see in the next year, and any additional things that you'd like to let me know or like to see, and it just helps me get a better gauge on how I can best serve the For the Love of History community and all of my delicious little donuts. And by filling out the For the Love of History annual census, you will be eligible for winning For the Love of History merch and one of my favorite books. So a little incentive to fill out the census. <laughs> so enough of that jibber jabber. Let's get on to the historical jibber jabber. This episode topic was actually inspired by one of my OG delicious donuts, an absolutely amazing history BFF who was kind, so kind, and sent me two amazing books this year. And one of the books is called The Writing of the Gods, The Race to Decode the Rosetta Stone. And when I tell you, I have read that book twice and then I went and I bought the audiobook version of it. It's so good. It's really so stinking interesting. And I am so thankful to that History BFF for sending it to me because I thought I knew everything that there was to know about the Rosetta Stone, which, you know, in hindsight is very silly of me to think. But while reading this book, I discovered one of my favorite historical beefs of all time between two decoders in a race to figure out how to read Egyptian hieroglyphs and unlock the secret of the Rosetta Stone. And that is exactly what we are going to talk about today. So grab your fuzziest socks and a warm beverage and prepare to spill some historical tea and let's get to it. The Rosetta Stone is arguably the most popular artifact in the British Museum and possibly the world. Rosetta Stone magnets, postcards, earrings, coasters, puzzles, and other Rosetta Stone paraphernalia are constantly the most popular sellers at the gift shop. Millions of goods are sold each year depicting this mystical stone. But despite it being so popular, there are a lot of misconceptions and hidden details surrounding it and its story. And as I found out, many a garbage human was involved in the history of the Rosetta Stone. And it all began with, in my opinion, one of the biggest garbage humans. Napoleon, I was once attacked by bunnies <laughs> Bonaparte, <laughs> which is his official name here on For the Love of History. 
I will never forget that that man was attacked by rabbits. Anyways, in the late 1700s, Mr. Attacked by Bunnies. <laughs> I can't. I can't call him that. <laughs> but I want to so bad. <laughs> Anyways, we'll call him by his other name, Napoleolio, okay? Napoleolio thought it was a great idea to go out and do some conquering, you know, colonization and all that. He was fully obsessed with Alexander the Great and decided that he too needed to go to Egypt and follow in the footsteps of his historical man crush. So he got together a big group of soldiers and savants who were artists, science people, mathematicians, bird people that are called ornithologists, I think, and all sorts of, just all sorts of science people and artists. He gathered 167 of these young men, their average age being 25, and without telling basically anyone where he was going, he took the whole happy lot to Egypt. The Egyptian expedition could be a whole nother episode itself, so we won't go into that, but because of this expedition, the Rosetta Stone was found. In July of 1799, a group of soldiers and conscripted Egyptian workers were expanding a fort in El Rashid when an Egyptian worker, whose name has unfortunately been lost to time, opened a wall and found the artifact of a lifetime. The soldier scientist who's credited with the discovery of the Rosetta Stone is Officer Pierre Francois Xavier Bocard. Some good French. Anyways, who was a rare savant soldier. He was both a respected soldier and an incredibly intelligent scientist. He was in charge of the fort operation and it was a stroke of pure serendipity that he was because other officers may not have recognized the significance of the find. It's impossible to know what Pierre and the others felt at that moment, but when they saw the three languages etched in stone, I'm sure they got chills in the desert when they realized it was a three-way translation of ancient Greek, a language called Demotic, and ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. Unfortunately for Pierre, the second garbage human of our story would come swiftly into the scene, stealing away any chance he had at researching or looking further into this magnificent stone. And that garbage human, dear one, is Jacques Francois Manu. And if you're watching the YouTube version of this episode, you can see him right here. And he has an extremely punchable face. Now, we do not condone punching people in the face here at For the Love of History. But this guy, this guy is the worst. He is the worst. And if he were to ask me after eating a spinach salad, if he had something stuck in his teeth, I would look that man dead in the eye. And even though his teeth were full of spinach particles, I would tell him, no, you're good clean as a whistle and I would let that man walk out into the world with spinach all up in his teeth because he is the worst and also if I weren't a calm cool collected unbiased person I would tell him that his last name sounds like manure but again I would never say any of that because I am mature and <laughs> yep <laughs> I am mature I would I would never say that his name sounds like manure. So manure, I mean Mano, <laughs> was a notoriously cruel and awful man who would torture locals and hit on married women and also tried to get Napoleon's mistress. He tried to get with Napoleon's mistress, who, by the way, Napoleon had just recently abandoned in Egypt. But I will digress. And what I will talk about is how he straight up took the Rosetta Stone into his tent and hoarded it. Because, and this is a rumor, but it follows with his many character flaws, he wanted to sell it to the highest bidder and get some money, get some acclaim. But the British had other 
plans. You see, during this time, the French and the British were not cool with each other, and two years after the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, the French surrendered to the British in Egypt, and the savants had collected all sorts of precious artifacts and data and all that fun historical record-changing stuff and wanted to take it back and keep it in France with them. But the British were like, no, not going to happen. So the British soldiers packed up all the good stuff and left all the teeny tiny little bits and bobs to the French. And this included the Rosetta Stone. And it was put on a ship and sent to England and then later would be put in, you guessed it, the British Museum. Before I read the writing of the gods, I thought two things. One, hieroglyphs were used a lot closer to the current era than they really were. And two, that the Rosetta Stone was like the key that immediately unlocked hieroglyphs. Like I knew it was tough to crack the code, but I thought the translation was a one-to-one -one and that archaeologists and linguists just like figured it out in no time. But dear one, this could not be farther from the truth. The European journey of unlocking the mystery of the Rosetta Stone is an extremely significant part of the hieroglyph history, but it only takes up about 20-ish years in the thousand-year-long quest to unlock the mysteries of Egyptian hieroglyphs. The last known use of hieroglyphs was in the year 394 CE by a priest at Philae Temple, and that was 1,600-ish years ago. And even then, the use and working knowledge of Egyptian hieroglyphs was extremely low. A new writing system called Coptic had entered the scene about 200 years before the last hieroglyph was written and began replacing hieroglyphs because it was just way easier to learn and do. And before Coptic, another writing system called Demotic was used way more by everyday people people. And before that, another writing system called Demotic was used way more by the everyday person than hieroglyphs were. Demotic was basically a shorthand for hieroglyphs, and that shorthand was what informed the creation of Coptic. So it's like if you took someone's sticky note scribblings and then made a whole new language and writing system out of it. And to give you some more perspective on just how scarce Egyptian hieroglyph use was, Cleopatra, the last pharaoh of Egypt, was the first Ptolemaic pharaoh ever that could read and speak Egyptian. And the Ptolemaic dynasty was 300 years long. The ability to speak, write, and understand Egyptian hieroglyphs had been lost more than 1,000 years before the Rosetta Stone had been found for nearly as long innumerable people have been failing to decipher it. But that was not for lack of trying. Honestly, the perfect serendipitous storm had to brew for the breakthrough to even occur. And this, dear one, is where our story begins. If you do a straight up Google search about the person who decoded the Rosetta Stone, you will find that it was Jean-Francois Champollion. And I'm very proud of that pronunciation and his name is so fun to say. What you will not find, however, is the years of beef between the prodigy Jean-Francois Champollion and the other prodigy, Thomas Young. Let me first introduce you to our two decoders, our main characters of this story. The differences between their personalities are like a perfectly written enemies to lovers trope, polar opposites in every way. Thomas Young, the level-headed, calm, cool, and collected older Englishman with a love for all things analytical and measured. Then we had the often hysterical and very snarky French prodigy Jean-Francois Champollion, whose life motto was never do things in moderation when they could be done to excess. And like, I, I, got, I gotta get you. <laughs> Their story does not, however, end up with them falling in love, but I am telling you, friend, that is a fanfic waiting to happen, and if you write it, credit me, which is a nice little piece of foreshadowing for what's about to come. Ooh, foreshadowing. Anyways, 
Although there was a 17-year difference between Young and Champollion, Champollion being the younger of the two, they began studying the Rosetta Stone at the same time. A very much fun little life coincidence, this story is full of them. And when Young began, he was not solely dedicated to the Rosetta Stone. He had many other interests besides studying what would later be called Egyptology. He didn't particularly care for the mystical aspect of Egyptian gods and goddesses, nor did he really think hieroglyphs were the stuff of ancient magic and old wisdoms long forgotten in the sands of time, like so many other scholars did. Young was nothing if not a practical guy and simply wanted to crack the code. He was also a linguistic genius and had an amazing photographic memory and trained himself to sift through huge amounts of linguistic information at an incredibly fast speed. This is probably what led him to be the first person to partially crack a small but very significant part of the Rosetta Stone. So back in the early 2000s, it was super popular at my high school to have cartouche necklaces. And if you've never seen them, they are these long ovals with lines at the bottom that look like stands. And they were all the rage and all the cool kids had them with their names written in hieroglyphs, air quotes inside of them. Now they have lost their popularity, but people still know what they are. However, during Young's time, no one knew what they were, but our big brain analytical man figured out that cartouches in hieroglyphs were used to highlight royal names. They were written inside the ovals, the cartouches, to emphasize, to highlight, almost like italics or quotes in our modern English language. And this discovery was a huge deal because in the Greek part of the Rosetta Stone, which Young could read, it said the name Ptolemy V. He had cracked one word of the code, which may not sound like a lot, but he was the first person in over 1,000 years that read an Egyptian hieroglyph. And from here, he was able to decode royal names from many other artifacts and began compiling a sort of alphabet. He published his findings, but did so anonymously, which would come back to kind of bite him in the tuchus. Now, let us shift our attention to the bad boy linguist himself, Jean-Francois Champollion. His name is so fun. He was obsessed with languages and could speak and write over 13 by the time he was a teenager. And he sure did let everyone know how smart he was. He was also obsessed with Egypt. And where Young saw pomp and vanity, Champollion saw awe and wonder and wisdom. He was deep into Egyptomania before it was cool. His journey with the Rosetta Stone is much less cut and dry because for a while he poured himself into the study, but then he gave up and decided to study Coptic, which was a leap that would pay off greatly because at the time, no one knew that Coptic was related to Demotic, which was the third language on the Rosetta Stone. His intense study of the Rosetta Stone didn't really begin until he lost his job because of his very extreme political views. Uh, he said some things about murdering kings and priests with their own intestines, but I will digress. <laughs> so unemployed and staying at his brother's, Champollion dove into deciphering the Rosetta Stone. In the very beginning, both men were completely unaware of each other, until Young, who was so frustrated that the Rosetta Stone wasn't revealing its secrets in a few days, like he had predicted it would, wrote to his friend about the frustration. In the reply letter, Young's friend was basically like, oh hey, that sucks. P.S. And by the way, have you heard about this genius young French guy who's also making some progress with the Rosetta Stone? And Young was like, WTF, no, I have not. Uh, who is this? I need to read everything he's ever written and see if he's really a threat or just some kid. And then after neving, neving, neving had heard of, <laughs> after never having heard of Champollion before, just a few days later, he heard about Champollion 
again. And then, in the strangest twist of fate, Champollion contacted Young on accident. I know. I know what you're thinking. TK, how can that be? It's the 1800s. It's not like Champollion butt called him, right? He didn't like, his butt didn't pick up a fountain pen, write a letter, and then post it, did he? (laughs) Which is a funny thing to think about. But you're right, dear one. He did not butt dial or butt letter young. But what he did do was basically the 1800s equivalent of dialing the wrong phone number. Unfortunately for Champollion, he had some very poor quality versions of the Rosetta Stone and wanted better ones with no mistakes. So he contacted the Royal Society, thinking that they would be able to help him, but they had nothing to do with the Rosetta Stone. And the letter was then forwarded to the Royal Society's foreign secretary that dealt with correspondence with scientists outside of England. And guess who that was? Freaking Thomas Young. It was freaking Thomas Young. So Champollion, Thomas Young accidentally came into contact with each other. It, it's just wild. It's... It, 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 Consider my flabbers gasted. That is amazing. And Thomas, Thomas Young was like, oh my God, OMFG, this kid keeps popping up all of a sudden. Let me just, let me help him out, okay? The universe is clearly telling me something. No, he didn't say that. He's, he's too stoic for that. He wouldn't say the universe told him anything. Anyways, at first, the relationship between Young and Champollion was cordial. Two geniuses wanted to solve the world's oldest puzzle. They were simply two nerds in paradise. And when Champollion wanted some more copies of the Rosetta Stone and other artifacts, he would just go talk to Young and Young would give him the hookup. Sure, their countries were at war, but they were men of science and didn't bother with all that war stuff. However, this honeymoon phase would not last because Champollion is hella petty started when Champollion made an incredible breakthrough. Through his study of Coptics, he was able to discover the phonetic sounds of many demonic and then Egyptian hieroglyphs, which then led him to discover the sounds of many other symbols. And Champollion was so excited that he ran to his brother all the way across the town, flung open the doors and yelled, I've done it, then collapsed and didn't wake up for five days. When he woke up on the 27th of September, 1822, he sent one of the most historically important letters titled Letter to M. Dacier concerning the alphabet of the phonetic hieroglyphs, thus creating the foundational text upon which ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs were first systematically deciphered. It was incredible news, and Champollion was invited to present his findings at a conference in Paris. And in another twist of wacky fate, Young also attended that conference and was invited to sit right next to Champollion. Now, I couldn't find anywhere if Young knew ahead of time what was about to happen, but whether he did or didn't, I don't think it would have made what Champollion did next any easier. Champollion reported his findings to a hall of wide-eyed and astonished men of science. I'm sure the room was a full uproar of applause, hands feverishly slapping together in praise of this once-in-a-lifetime breakthrough but one pair of hands was notably less exuberant in their applause. Because not once did Champollion mention whose work and support he used in finding the connection between Coptic and Demotic, which led to the breakthrough. Thomas Young's work was intentionally downplayed in order for Champollion to soak up the glory of being the one man who cracked the Rosetta Stone, and unlocked the secrets of Egyptian hieroglyphs. And so began the great Rosetta Stone beef of the 1800s. Young was understandably shooketh. His flabbers were gasted, his shivers were timbered, his wig, in other words, was snatched. 
and in a letter to the British antiquarian William Richard Hamilton, who had been responsible for bringing the Rosetta Stone to England, he wrote, I have found here, or rather recovered, Mr. Champollion Jr., who has been living these ten years on the inspection of Rosetta, and who has lately been making some steps in Egyptian literature, which really appear to be gigantic. It may be said that he found the key in England, which has opened the gate for him, which is a very spicy, passive-aggressive, 1800s way of saying this little shit did not give me any credit for being the one who first made the connection between Demotic and Coptic and publishing the first partial decipher. What WTF is going on right now? But in his very calm and pragmatic way, he ended the spicy letter by saying he will do everything within his power to continue to support Champollion. However, he was not going to take this lying down. Young then clapped back at Champollion by making the 19th century equivalent of a dish track and published a book called An Account of Some Recent Discoveries in Hieroglyphical Literature and Egyptian Antiquities, with the subtitle being Including the Author's Original Alphabet as Extended by Mr. Champollion. As Extended. This was a not-so-subtle way of saying that Young was indeed the first to decipher the Rosetta Stone and that Champollion simply added to Young's already existing work. My face is getting red. Oh my gosh. This diss was as big as when Eminem wrote Killshot dissing MGK, when Taylor Swift released We're Never Getting Back Together about Jake Gyllenhaal, or when Beyonce's whole Renaissance album came out to throw Jay-Z under the bus for cheating on her. What I am saying is that this was some hot, hot goss in 18... <laughs> Everyone in the academic community was like, I cannot believe what Young just did. But here's the thing. Champollion quickly responded by telling Young, I shall never consent to recognize any other original alphabet than my own, where it is a matter of the hieroglyphic alphabet properly called. Basically telling Young that his alphabet was shitty and wrong <laughs> and that Champollion's was the correct one. Which, I mean, he, that was mean, but he's not wrong. Champollion did have a more accurate deciphering than Young did, but it was very mean. They're being very mean right now. So shots were fired and the men were forever rivals. <laughs> For years, the two were at odds and both saying not so nice things to one another, both publicly and privately. But if you allow me to release Spicy TK for a moment, she would say that Champollion is a little bit of an asshat. Oh, like, I know he is considered the father of Egyptology or whatever, but he sucked. Kind of. <laughs> he was so mean. All Young wanted was to be recognized for the work that he had done in 1815, and Champollion gave him two big old middle fingers way up. Sorry, not sorry. That's not happening. And not long before Young passed away in 1829, Champollion wrote one of the meanest things ever to his brother while he was in Egypt. Apparently, Young had been stirring up the Paris academic scene by trying once again to get recognition for his work, and Champollion had this to say about it. So poor Dr. Young is incorrigible. Why flog a mummified horse? The Brit can do whatever he wants. It will remain ours, and all of old England will learn from young France how to spell hieroglyphs using an entirely different method. May the doctor, Dr. Young, continue to agitate about the alphabet while I, having been for six months among the monuments of Egypt, I am startled by what I am reading fluently rather than what my imagination is able to come up with. Not long after Young passed away, Champollion went on to decipher all sorts of temples and texts, but he too would pass away from a stroke in 1832. 
two of the most brilliant minds in history through luck, serendipity, and the universe's love of chaos and irony unlocked a thousand year old mystery. And in the process, not only created a new field of study, but a new chapter in history, allowing the secrets of ancient Egypt to slowly be unlocked. Now you can take Egyptian hieroglyph classes in universities all over the world. You can use a tiny supercomputer in your pocket to look up the hieroglyphs of your favorite Egyptian god and at your fingertips is the culmination of hundreds of thousands of years of history and knowledge and you can read right now in hundreds of languages translations of the Rosetta Stone. A world Young and Champollion probably could have never imagined. And this story, if anything, reminds me of how silly and magical and weird the world is for any of what we have talked about today to have happened. So many other events needed to take place. The 13-year-old Ptolemy V had to have become Pharaoh and his advisors and priests had to have recommended that he make this stela. Napoleon had to have been obsessed with Alexander the Great. Pierre-Francois Xavier Barcade had to have been the one on duty when it was found. Young and Champollion had to have been alive at the same time. Champollion had to have written that letter and sent it to the wrong place. And so many other tiny, seemingly insignificant things had to happen for this mystery to unlock. And I just think that that is so cool. And thanks to these two prodigies and all of the other events that had to happen, we are now able to learn all sorts of wonderful and weird things like the history of Hatshepsut and the legend of our friend Sobek, the Lord of Baby Gravy. And that, my friend, is the brief and true story of the Rosetta Stone and the academic rivalry of the century. Well, dear one, we have come to our final thought. And today I have a recommendation and also a small request of of sorts. So first of all, um, I'd like to recommend the book that inspired this episode today, The Writing of the Gods. It is such a comprehensive and easy to understand history of the Rosetta Stone and it goes into a deep dive about how it was deciphered and absolutely wonderfully explains the relationship between these two men, all of the other factors that were involved in cracking the code of the Rosetta Stone, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful book. And my second final thought is a bit of a request. So the Rosetta Stone is housed at the British Museum, and there are several petitions going around requesting to have it be given back to Egypt. If you have watched any documentaries about Egypt and archaeology, you have probably seen Dr. Zahi Hawass, who has been working tirelessly since 2002 to repatriate artifacts that have been stolen from Egypt. This does not include legitimately acquired artifacts. This does include illegitimately acquired artifacts. Artifacts that were stolen as spoils of war, artifacts that were looted, artifacts that were unethically purchased on the antiquities trade, which is a big black market. They want these artifacts back in the hands of the Egyptian people. And with the opening of the Grand Egyptian Museum at Giza, there is now a safe and secure location for these artifacts to go to. But time and time again, the British government has rejected all requests for these artifacts and many other artifacts to be returned, saying that the Egyptian government has never formally requested these items back, which is just... I have so many feelings about that. but. There is a petition by Dr. Zahi Hawassa and many other archaeologists to get these artifacts back. And if you do have time, it takes 
two minutes, if that, to sign the petition to get these artifacts back. It started in 2022 and it is still going. It is 100,000 signatures short of the 300,000 goal. If you do have time, it would be great to help support the effort in getting these artifacts back to the people and the cultures that they belong to. Well, dear one, thank you so much for joining me in this episode. I absolutely loved it. I am a hardcore Egyptian history nerd, and I loved this so much. It was my first time doing a deep dive into the Rosetta Stone, and I cannot thank that history BFF enough who sent me this book. It was an absolute hit. Thank you so much. And if you enjoyed this episode, I would appreciate it if you could consider... <laughs> leaving a rating or a review. I've also seen a lot of people submitting their comments on episodes using the new Spotify commenty thingy, which is so, so cool. I get to hear your thoughts on each episode, which is really fun. You can also join us over on Patreon if you'd like to support the podcast in that way. Patreons are basically responsible for keeping this podcast going and growing and improving. Patreons are the reason I am able to get a subscription to a royalty-free music, better recording equipment, and all sorts of cool things. So if you'd like to see the podcast, podcast bro and get better that's a really good way to help do that <laughs> but that may not be available to everyone and that is totally okay we have merch that you can buy like this super cute hoodie which is so comfortable and also some free 99 ways to support the podcast by subscribing leaving comments leaving reviews and sending this or any episode to your other history bff and with all that said, it was quite a long episode, so I'm going to leave you there. <laughs> but before I let you go, please make sure that you do something kind to yourself. Take care of yourself. Drink your water. I'm going to take a little sippy sip. Take a sippy sip with me. <sighs> okay. <laughs> I'm dying. <clears throat> and I will see you next week. <laughs> when we have two very special guests and I am so excited to introduce to you the authors of a very very cool book that is coming out next year so I will see you then friend okay love you bye Mwah! why is there a metronome right now oh, okay <laughs> <laughs>